I had an early start with coding, and my dad played a big role in that. He, he was an electrical engineer at Bell Laboratories, which was the mecca for telecommunications research and development for many years. He taught me about binary numbers when I was a little kid, and he gave me a kit that I could assemble together to add and subtract binary, binary numbers using wires and mechanical switches. One day, he brought home one of the earliest programmable calculators from work, a Hewlett Packard 97. It was a $750 marvel back in 1975. That's the same as $3,000 in today's dollars. I remember painstakingly tapping in, line by line, the instructions for a lunar lander game, like following a recipe. And if I made a mistake, I had to start all over. And then I got to play my first computer game. I wrote my first computer program using punch cards. And then my dad took me into work so that I could run the punch cards through the massive mainframe computer there. And by massive, I mean that it took up an entire room. And then outspat the drawing that I had programmed. In eighth grade, our math teacher acquired an Apple computer for the class, a very early Apple computer that was connected to a cassette player, wrote data out to a cassette player. For those of you in the audience who may be too young to know what a cassette player was, <laughs> it's equivalent to, to today's thumb drive. She taught us how to code using the basic programming language. And I remember writing these long messes of code all tangled up with go-to statements. Back in those days, we would write out our programs longhand on paper and then take our turn at the computer to type in the program and run it. Now, I can guess what you're all thinking. You're all thinking, ah, so that's how she got into programming. It all makes sense. But you'd actually be wrong. I decided in that eighth grade programming class that coding was, it was kind of fun. It was fun like solving logic problems is fun but that it wasn't really intellectually challenging, that it wasn't very creative, and that if I had to do it all day, I would get bored. Also, I just didn't really know what it was good for. I didn't know what it was good for besides solving the toy problems they assigned us in class and maybe writing computer games, which did not interest me. So I decided at the age of 13 that coding was not for me. So in some sense, this talk is for current day reincarnations of my younger self to help explain a bit what coding is good for and how you can change the world if you know how to program. Everywhere we turn, we hear about the importance of STEM. We hear about how valuable a skill coding is. But we don't hear so much about what you can actually do if you know how to code. So that's what I'm gonna talk about. Let's talk about what coding is good for. Let's talk about, for example, what you can do to advance the field of medicine if you know how to code. There's a company called Cardiogram. It's one of many companies doing truly exciting work that sits at the intersection of wearables, medicine, and computer science. Now, when most of us think about wearables, we think about devices like the Fitbit or the Apple Watch. We think about tracking how many steps we take during the day. We think about tracking our sleep at night. We think about tracking our heart rate when we exercise. Cardiogram has built an app that also tracks your heart rate. And people who use Cardiogram use it for the same reasons that many people use wearables and fitness apps. The Cardiogram app on their watch tells them how their heart rate changes during the course of the day based on what they're doing. It turns out that your heart rate goes up when you eat spicy food. Did you know that? It also turns out that your heart rate goes up during stressful situations, for example, when giving a talk in front of a large audience. <laughs> the cardiogram app on people's watch tells them how their heart rate, yeah, I said that already. So the cardiogram app will measure your heart rate 200 times per day. And it has hundreds of thousands of users. 
Many of those users have agreed to share their heart rate data back to Cardiogram for use in medical studies. The team at Cardiogram is using that data to screen for issues with the heart. They're trying to learn how to tell the difference between a healthy heart and an unhealthy heart. And they're doing this for a condition called atrial fibrillation in collaboration with medical researcher researchers. What is atrial fibrillation? In atrial fibrillation, electrical conduction in the heart becomes disorganized. The upper chamber may beat 300 to 500 times per minute. Compare that to a regular heart rate of 60 to 100 times per minute. The lower chamber may beat at a normal rate, but irregularly. Atrial fibrillation is treatable, but it often goes undiagnosed because many people don't feel any symptoms. The team at Cardiogram, oh, and every, each year, 100,000 people, 100,000 strokes are caused by atrial fibrillation. And for me, it's personal because two of my family members have this condition. The team at Cardiogram is writing software to learn how to tell the difference between the variations in heart rhythm for a healthy heart versus the variations in rhythm for an unhealthy heart. They're using a technique called deep learning to do this. Many of you may have heard of deep learning recently. It's been in the news a lot. It's the same technique that's being used to solve many other very hard problems. Last year, a team of computer scientists used this approach to write a program that beat the world champion in the game of Go for the first time. The team at Cardiogram is also using, atrial is also using deep learning, but to screen for atrial fibrillation. They're already able to correctly detect atrial fibrillation nine out of 10 times. So that's medicine. How about another field like education? How can software engineers transform education? Did you know that there are over 1.2 billion people learning another language and that the majority are doing so in order to gain access to better opportunities? Unfortunately, language education is expensive and inaccessible to most. At Duolingo, we wanted to change that, so we built an app targeted at language education. We created Duolingo so that everybody could have an opportunity to learn another language. It's completely free, and it's accessible to anyone, anywhere in the world. There are more people actively learning a language on Duolingo than there are students in the United States public school system. It's being used by some of the wealthiest people in the world, like Bill Gates and Hollywood stars, and at the same time by public school students in developing countries. And by the way, Duolingo is located right here in Pittsburgh. It was created down the street by Luis Fanon, who's right there, <laughs> a professor in computer science and by, uh, by Severin Hacker, who was then his PhD student. That's right, Duolingo started out as a student project. Here are some statistics. There are 170 million people using Duolingo to learn another language. About half of our users are using Duolingo to learn English, because for many people, English opens the door to new opportunities and maybe the pathway out of poverty to a better life. The top five languages that people are learning on Duolingo are English, Spanish, French, German, and Italian. Duolingo has 69 language courses in all, and we're working on 18 more. We recently launched our first African language, Swahili, in collaboration with the Peace Corps. And now we're working on Japanese. People have been asking us for Japanese for years. It will be available on Duolingo in May. Now, the common request that we get is that people want to practice conversation. The idea is, if you're an English speaker learning French, we should pair you up with a French speaker learning English, and maybe the two of you can kind of teach each other. It sounds like a really elegant idea, and we've tried it, and every time we've tried it, we find that most people don't like it because they're embarrassed to speak in a foreign language with another person. So instead, 
we decided to work on something called conversational bots. The idea is that you could learn to speak another language just by talking with a bot that is smart enough. We think this can be the future of language education. Learning a language by talking with a bot that is smart enough. Smart enough to adjust its level of conversation to the user. Smart enough to gently correct when appropriate. Smart enough to understand broken English, broken French, or broken Spanish. And smart enough to remember and build upon previous conversations. We've built a first version of this, a basic chatbot that can talk with you in French, Spanish, German, or Portuguese. You can have simple conversations on ordinary topics like going shopping, finding a roommate, ordering coffee, or going to a basketball game. Now here's a short video to show how it works. Hola. ¿Cómo estás? Qué bien. Conoce a mis amigos. Primero, dile hola a Roberto. Roberto está ocupado. Él está comiendo. ¿Qué está comiendo Roberto? Correcto. Roberto está comiendo pizza. As you can see, we designed, we de designed this to look like a familiar messaging app. <laughs> so that it looks like, so that it feels like you're chatting with a friend while learning a foreign language without the anxiety of making mistakes. The bot corrects you, gently corrects you when you make a mistake by showing you a better answer, and it gives you hints if you get stuck. Those are just two examples of what coding is good for. There are so many others that I could have talked about. I could have talked about how it's being used in the arts for computer animations and special effects, how it's being used in the humanities to reconstruct the social relationship networks of historical figures, about how it's used to build apps for local communities and government in Pittsburgh's own Steel City Code Fest a week-long hackathon that happens every year. In fact, it's starting this year on Friday. I chose to talk about just two areas, medicine and education, to show how coding is being used for social good. I hope this ho helps open people's mind to the power of coding, and I hope that everyone here will help spread the word. Learning to code is more than just solving problems. It's more than stretching your mind. It's more than opening the door to new job opportunities. It's a chance to change the world and to make the world a better place.